the legends and super legends. Welcome to Velo Harmony. Today is another misty day. Um, it's forecasted to just be overcast, but it rained on and off throughout the night. Not heavily, just light. So I went outside and put, I had just put on my jersey and my gilet. And it just wasn't enough. So even though it's 11C and it's going to get up to like 16C, that's like... 51 or 52 to like 61, 62 during the ride. It feels cooler because of the moisture and the direction of the wind. So I'm putting on a light base layer. This is an MD base layer. And then I'm gonna put on this thermal jersey. They're very versatile in that. They can handle very cold temperatures and they breathe very well as the temperature goes up. But it's not gonna warm up much. So to be comfortable, I'm putting on three layers because I went outside and I verified it. So it does help to go out there. Um, I'm going to take a little more food because it's cold. And because it's relatively, well, I would say it's cool, but relatively mild, I'm taking two bottles. Because once it's above 10 C, I tend to drink more. And they're both electrolytes. I don't just take water this time of year. This Gile has turned out to be very functional. I used it a lot this week because we've had a bunch of misty days. It not only keeps you warm, but keeps the water off your core. So I'm very pleased with it. I love the lower zip here. It's very functional. Makes it easy for you to get into your pockets or regulate your temperature whichever is best. So, I'm going to take a lot of food because the weather is cool. I'm taking two of these granola bars. I'm taking four gels. I've already ingested one gel because this time of the morning, my appetite is such that I don't feel like any solids. So. What I do is I try to put the gels towards the back of my pocket. It's easy to do because of the material that they're made of. They just kind of go behind. And then what I'm going to do, the other granola bars are very crunchy, so I don't cut them. These, I just cut the top. Makes it a lot easier to get to. You can just slide them up the bag because they're solid. These are the Nature Valley Trill Mix bars. I take them just to have variety. The gels are there if I'm in the mood to where we're riding and I don't want any solids, then I'll take the gel, but I go for these first. They're a lot less expensive, so I'd much rather have the gel and bring them back home if I don't need them. So I put all the food in one pocket. Now I'm gonna get my kit. And any jersey that has a loop, what I do is I put the pump in the loop. It just keeps it in one spot. So what I do is I pull, the loop is sewn into these jerseys. Just put that through the loop, slip it in there. And then I, the reason I brought this is, this is the SF bag. I'm not carrying this because I need my middle pocket to hold uh, the camera. But I wanna make sure that I have the spoke wrench I need because this spoke wrench is specifically for the Campac Nolo Euros wheel. Just in case something happens, I have it. And so it's in there. So what I do is I make a decision on which spoke wrench I'm carrying. Usually I keep it in that bag, but this week I use this bag when I was riding. You always want to have something to work with what you have on the bike, just in case something's ha something happens. You don't want to be out there and not have the tools that you need. So now I'm fully loaded. And so to get the camera in now, just do this on the road, pull it up, slip it in the middle pocket. That's where it sits with the gimbal when we're not filming. I'm wearing the blue because it goes with the helmet. It's a nice contrast. You can see how it's going to look. 
and I already got my shoe covers on. I hope you all get a chance to get some K's in. We're gonna get some good clips for you. On this ride, Paul and I left Northampton, went into the woodlands to pick up Team RR. Once we picked up Team RR, while we were on research for us, we met Jerry Luton, one of the local hard men. Went out 1486. Neville and Michael decided to turn back as the roads were too wet for them, I guess. It wasn't raining that much, just a little drizzle. We headed out into Dobbin. There was a lot of action on Jackson Road. I think you guys would like the clips that we took for you there. Once we got past Dakas, we told the group we were going north, they went south, but Jerry Lutner joined us. We headed out of Osborne Road through the forest there, 1375. Then we went back to 149, we cut through the forest. We took uh, Base Chapel Road back on 149 there, came to Bethel Road, took Bethel Road down what we call the Gorilla Route there, into Dakas, got on 1486. Then we took Mount Moriah Road South, which is harder. We got through there, went left, and took the tri -Lakes area. A lot of hills in there, and the pace was very good. Jerry kept pressing the pace. And then we rode back into the woodlands via Honia Egypt Road. Jerry kept trying to get us to do more kilometers, but we just ran out of time. It was almost close to eight hours when we got there, and I just, I hadn't told my wife I was gonna be gone that long, so. I just didn't want to stay out any longer. Uh, well, no, I mean, and you have to go up 1486, but you also have to be the discussing the route. You're talking about 1488 all the way out to the McDonald's in 1774. Yeah, but not. Don't turn on 1774. Right. I did that this week. You don't want to do that because that's that's. There's some very narrow with curves, so okay. you still have to do the little, uh, uh, what's it, Goodson Road yep. to, to David, and come back. I don't know, I mean, I'm okay with either one of those. What do you guys, you know, so what, do we go to Magnolia, or do we go just to Jackson? Jackson to Mount Moriah, and then- How far is that way? To go that way, Valley Grove, and Johnson. How many miles is that mountain? Good. That would be About 65. Okay. Let's be real careful in the turns and the chair with the road conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Careful, yeah. Mr. Uh, running in front of every car on the road. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's Michael who uh, got your nerve to tell us to be careful on the turns. turns. Are you pretty familiar with the roads? Yes. You this are. is Arturo. Okay, so. he just, just sit in, man. Save First time I've seen him. He's concerned about being out of hand. I'm Paul. What's your name? Arturo. Arturo. Let's roll. So Arturo was not able to hang. We waited for him, but we didn't both see him after the overpass. <laughs> I'm going. trying to wake up. Yeah, Michael is like, do as I say, not as I do. This guy is a reckless rider, got the nerve to tell us to be careful in turns because it's it's wet. We know it's wet. Yeah. You know, come on. I just, I shut him up there because it's like, that's Michael. He's telling us to be careful. This guy who runs in front of cars and the cars are always blowing at him. You know, I mean, really? Like, you're not the man who should be talking about being careful. He, you're reckless. So, but he was smart. He kept, he, 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 he quieted down right away. That's a poser move. That was us. Telling us to do something that you don't do. Telling us to be careful. He ended up turning around. He didn't say anything to anyone in the group. Yeah. By the time we get to, I believe, 1488, he is no longer there. You'll see it. And then later on, when we stop at a store, because John, I would point out John, is a guy on the left there, next to Paul H. on the left on the green bike. John needed to use the restroom. He had mentioned to me, you know, when the weather's cold like this, sometimes if you don't uh, use the restroom, you, you kind of feel like you've got to go. And we always do, you know, once we ride up to these guys, we have a need to go sometimes. So we ended up stopping at a store. We, we, in a little bit, we'll, we'll hook up with one of the local hard men, Jerry Lutner. He's in our Bella Harmony Club on Strava. He owns a lot of the Strava KOMs all around Strong Boy. So he ends up going with us. He finds out we're going long and he's thrilled because he's been sick for about a week. Like he said two weeks, actually, which for him, he said, that's unusual. 
So uh, he's just getting back and he wants to do a long ride. So the three of us, Paul, myself, and Jerry, end up doing this epic ride. He wanted us to go even further. Jerry wanted us to go even further, but just ran out of time. It ended up being a long day. So we'll, we'll shoot for that another day. I'm chatting with uh, John here. Sure what we're talking about at this point but in a little while we'll start talking about fit because paul h of in front of john came and got fitted he got a bellow harmony fit and uh we found out after this ride after we the group split they came back mark who was in front of him posted on the board that paul h pulled for like half of the journey of the entire ride so he must have really liked his new position one thing i did notice He's now holding a straighter, smoother line. He's not swerving when he's on his arrow bars. I raised his arrow bars to where his hands naturally wanted one to be. He had them horizontally placed. I raised them about probably 25 degrees to meet his hands. And since we centered his weight on the saddle, his saddle was three centimeters, 3.4 centimeters too high. That's about an inch and a quarter. It's significant. So we lowered his saddle, got his fore out, set up, and all that rocking's gone. You can see him in front of us right there. And, and because his weight's on the saddle now, it's not on the front end, now when he's on the arrow bars, he's tracking a straight line. And I ended up mentioning to him on this ride, and I noticed, wow, you're holding a straight line. So uh, I replied to Mark's post that he put on the board. I said, well, Paul is just supposed to test his new position. I guess he liked it enough the way he was doing all that pulling. He's not reaching for the pedal anymore. And so, uh, the fit went really well. I had two guys on Friday. So Friday was a very busy day for me. Normally I try to space out the fits, but uh, I had to squeeze another guy back in. So, we had a ride coming up on Sunday. We had done him on Wednesday, and he needed some tweaking, so we, I told him to come in on Friday, let's get it done for his big ride. He's one of the few riders, Zara's one of the, that's, that's Jerry right there, coming across the highway. He sees us, and so he starts to soft pedal, the light catches up, this is a three-way, kind of a dead end, the left dead end, the light starts to change, Mark goes, it will change right here, There's no cars coming. But anyway, what I'm saying is Zarek is one of the guys who the formula didn't quite nail him down. It was a good starting point, but we had to go up for him. But with his setup, it was kind of unusual. So I like those kind of fits because you learn something new about the human body. That's Jerry on the right, our local strong board. Owns a lot of KOMs in the area on Strava. He and uh, Fabian and Mo, hey, they're always trading hey, places hey, at the top. He rides with Mo's group. He said he left home late and he thought they were ahead. He said it might be been, They were on time. They, they, they probably had a, a small turnout. I mean, it, the roads are damp, so with my mud guard, I even clean my mud guards. If you will notice, I think I put an arrow on in a little while. I put something almost like armor all on my mud guard, and it looked really good. Normally, I don't pay much attention to them, but I noticed that Paul Longo one day had cleaned his mud guards and treated it with something like armor all, like you would treat the black trim on your car, and it just looked good. So since I, was, I cleaned the bike this week, I decided I would clean the mud guard. And Paul even commented on it. Paul even commented on it. He said it looked really good. You go where I bevel, you go left, you go right, for about 15 degrees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jerry asked us what we're doing today. We're telling him we're going to ride with these guys for a while, but we're going to break off. Something's out there, I gotta... Said he's been 
sick. I'm back yeah, off. Remember you said you were sick? Yeah, I was. Something my daughter brought to school for four days long. And so yeah, I took off. Two yeah, days. so he was ill. He's back, you know, but not the full week. And so he's excited to be back. That feels good enough to run. That's kind of how you have to go about it. When you're feeling like yourself, then you get back out. I mean, you gotta ease into it. Don't do your full program. So he's not doing the big, big miles because he did a shorter week. But next week, I think he's gonna. This week, actually, since this is Monday, he's gonna get back. This week that I went out, I got rain done. Always let your body heal the way you feel 100% before you resume your normal training level. You can even start riding and it as a tester to see how you feel. If you're tired, then you need to take it easy or you know not ride at all until you're 100%. Just never ignore what your body's telling you. So it was great. We had Jerry with us after we split from the group, and we ended up just doing a lot of exploring, and we hit a bunch of different back roads. It was fun. Right here, I asked Mark about his zip wheel warranty issue. <laughs> hey, so Mark. I wanted to mention here, look at the, the rain vest. That's a lightweight rain vest. See, no First water gets wheel. through. Paul shows it right there. It does its job. So I asked Mark about his zip warranty thing. He said they honored it. Uh, so Zip is going to replace his wheel. He had a rear wheel that cracked while they were doing the, the tensioning of the spokes. So they're going. He had to pay for a new hub because he had a power meter hub that G3, which we suspect is the culprit. But Zip didn't make that an issue. They just told him he'd need to pay for a hub because they needed to put a hub on the new rim since he didn't send in a hub. So get his wheels done and we're chatting and what I end up suggesting to him, I put the arrow on my pocket because right there my pockets open the security pocket on the side that's the little message that those are sunglass cleaners for your sunglasses uh, the cloth is attached to a string I was not aware at that time that I had left that pocket unzipped I had unzipped it and put my phone there and then I thought about it and put my phone in my Rafa bib shorts pocket on the back the radio pocket so that pocket didn't get too overloaded but I, I catch it later you'll see it on the film where I sit up and zip it up so I'm suggesting a mark that maybe you can train on these regular wheels you have and then ride your zips for your big rides or group rides or whatever extend the line. I'm telling him that Paul H has the same problem. Paul has Paul H up here has the same power meter on that wheel and it has the same lateral movement even though it's true because of the G3. He's got the same wobbly movement side to side that you have. And it's wheels of truth. And I had the same problem. I sold I sold my G3 hub on, on eBay. I, I disclosed what was going on. The guy who bought it was aware of it. And besides the fact it would quit every 10 days or so and you have to open it and re and take the battery out and put it back in as some kind of reset. I got tired of hassle. So whatever power meter I, I'm fortunate enough to get in the future, I want something more reliable and portable. That's that's what I'm looking for. I know it. I know it's coming and I'm ready for it. I don't know what the deal is. Shimano needs to just make a pedal power meter because I will snap it up in a second. I love their platform. John. John has uh, numbness in his hands, not because of the bike. He says his hands will even get numb when he's sleeping. Um, at this point, I'm not aware of it, but we end up talking about it on the highway coming up to see it. Because over here, Mark notices that Paul H is flying. Paul H is up the road there. Jerry's already up ahead. Jerry usually will go for like a Strava segment and then wait for us. So in a little bit, you hear Mark mention that Paul H is flying. I'm adjusting my shoe covers. It seems to be, but my pedal just seems to be sticking the cleat. This is where Mark mentioned that Paul is flying. Look at him go up there. I fitted him yesterday. Did you? 
So watch out, he's gonna hammer you in the hill. I'm gonna get on Paul's back wheel. So Mark was saying that, you know, Paul is, looks like he's flying, gonna sit on his wheel. So John hears that, and when I said I fitted him, fitted Paul yesterday, then John comes up and starts to ask me about hand numbness and how do you deal with that. I basically tell him, you're gonna have to come in and get fitted. I, you know, I don't do anything on the road. Um, but I noticed that John moves on his saddle. This is John coming into the picture here. He rides up to me and he starts to talk about the fit that he heard me. So I guess he found out I do fit based on my comment about Paul. And uh, I don't like to give people advice if I don't know their fit. I don't know their history, you know, because the advice may not help them. So I always tell somebody, you know, you gotta check everything. So I just tell them generally, make sure you're not you're not putting too much weight on your hands. You'll hear me tell them. He's telling me, he shows me his hand, he's telling me his hand gets numb. Uh, this is not where he tells me that it's something, an inherent problem that happens even when he's sleeping. So I relate to the bike, but I basically tell him that you just need to make sure your weight's on the saddle of your feet. That's what I'm telling him. That's uh, the arrow I put on my mud guards there. Look how shiny that is. I just, there's some kind of thing called, um, it's made by some company, it's in a can. It says uh, less time, more shine or something like that. All you do is you spray it on there and as it dries, it shines. You don't even need to rub it or do anything. So I did that on both of them and then looking good. So yeah, I'm telling Paul about the conversation I just had with John. John rides up to Mark. And I was telling Paul, I said, I told him, you know, I have to come in and get dialed in. I can't do a whole lot with no information. I have to come in and get dialed in. can't do anything out here. Yes, no, no hands. I can give you general information, but I, but I don't know what's going on. Nobody can really just pinpoint one thing that may be causing your problem. There are several things that, on, that gives the same sim symptoms. Okay, he's Go. Yeah, the driver ends up putting the signal on at the last minute. He wanted to signal right on the dock. Yeah. <laughs> I guess signals are optional. <laughs> That's what John said. He said signals are optional. Some drivers don't even turn on the headlights on a day like this. I'm not sure what they're saving it for. <laughs> you know, it's on the car. I always use the headlights on the car. Uh, the newer cars that have daytime running lights, my cars don't have daytime running lights, but I use them a lot. In days like these, they have my headlights on, even my fog lights. It just makes sense. So yeah, this is where I see Michael's no longer here. So he must have turned around before we crossed the highway because I did not see him, I was in front. So before we crossed the highway back there on 2978, he must have turned around out of old Egypt road or something, long before we got to even 2978. He didn't say anything to anyone. Neville is still here at this point. And after we turn left here, Neville will turn around because when we get to that shop, Up. That's Neville on my left as I go by. This is Neville right there. He turns around somewhere after we go across this highway and goes back. And I'm not aware of it. And in a little, in a few kilometers, well, maybe five or six kilometers, we stop for John here to use the restroom. But John had mentioned that he felt like going, but he didn't sing. He didn't tell me it was like an urgent thing. He mentioned that to Jerry and Jerry suggested that we stop. Jerry pulled into the shelf. 
this is where John is telling me about this problem. He said he's going to have an MRI because he has this issue with his hands going numb. Even when he's sleeping and he suspects that it's uh, being misdiagnosed because some of the people, the specialists he's seen, they, they told him only like the coffee funnel and he felt like the guy was just pushing that because that's just something the guy was comfortable with. Um, so he's got, he's get, he's going to get it looked at to find out why his hands are just arbitrarily going numb, even when in bed. So that's like a circulatory problem with the body. Tell him, well, that's cool that you're on top of it, because us guys were really bad about that, about seeing doctors, unless things are critical. So it was good to hear that he's getting it uh, looked at. So I'm going to try keeping those mud guards clean because they look really good like that. It, it, it had gotten kind of ashy and dull. That's what happens with black plastic when you don't treat it. And uh, it just really looks good on the bike there. So that's what we're talking about. He was asking whether we're going to go into Cimarron. I told him no. That's not part of the route. So if you're riding in a group like right now, we're not going hard. Uh, my heart rate confirms it. That's the one. We're talking. The fact that we're two abreast. That's another thing. Those are the little cues you look for. So if you get with a group like a tour is here, he's in the back. Uh, we don't see him much here. Uh, he ends up not being able to hold his pace once the group starts to go. But when you're riding with a group and you see people talking and chatting and two abreast, if it's hard for you at that point. That's the signal to say, hmm, okay, these guys have not started riding. That's a tour right there behind Paul. These guys have not started riding, so what you want to do then is, even though we're talking, stay close to the wheel, save your little energy. Make sure you're ready to expend the energy when the pace picks up. Now, if the group is just too fast for you, you have to let them go. And you keep riding because you will improve. picks up we will go single file and that's the cue to let you know that the riding has begun so even though the group's warming up this is not the time if you haven't been riding for a while or whatever it's not the time for you to be at the front because you're working harder the winds picked up a bit my heart rate bumped up to zone two John and I are still talking, just chatting about general stuff. What, what? And just from watching John here, I can tell his saddle could use a bit of tweaking. It's just a little bit of the hip roll that you see from a high saddle. The light turns red now. I know this light is short. The, le the street on the left dead ends into this highway. This light favors the highway. So I've, I've let everybody know early so we don't have to stop the go changes before we've got them. I think somewhere around here I'll go ahead and let John take the lead. I don't like to follow directly behind because um, he doesn't have mud guards on. So I stay on the white line while he's close to it. You see me moving a little left, but I've looked behind before. I kind of, and I use my my hearing. There's no cars coming, but I stay on just a little to the left of him, so I don't get in the direct line of spray. There's some spots on the road that is wetter than other spots. The hot shot, the hot shot 200 looks good in that spot. Even Paul Longa told me, man, you put it in a perfect place. It did not bother me. I, I will not be using it on the back of the saddle like I do some of the other lines. It just worked better lower than And I noticed that the, the light is so effective. The camera is not doing that light justice. What I do notice, you can see it better than my Dice 50, but 
that thing is like it's I've got to set what they call on day lightning mode and it when it when it flares out it's like a lightning storm it's all over the place so it's become like my preferred rear tail light they've got they've got a winner I mean I'm sure the 150 and the 100 just as good you don't need to keep going for the super super bright stuff you know somebody asked you know at what point does the marginal utility start to come down yeah you don't want it excessively bright it gets to where it's annoying but you can see it, it's pretty subtle on, on film here but in the real world that light when it when it pops it's like a, a, a solar storm it swirls around it's not that small it covers about the size of a car it just you know it's very effective you will definitely be seen with the Cygo like products I really like their offers I use the Dash 600 on Sunday after this ride I left before daylight because I wanted to ride 100 kilometers and get back home before noon so I left about 6 6.15, 6.20, thereabouts. It was still dark, about 20 minutes before sunrise. And I put the Dash 600 on just a steady beam with a, a little pulse. That thing lit the room as well as my car headlights do. That's the one I run with the flashing that goes for 80 hours. In that setting, it wouldn't last 80 hours. So I only used it for the 20 minutes I needed to. And once daylight came, I switched it to the daylight mode. The, the lights work. So I will be getting another one of the, the, the Pro 200. These are, the, these are my preferred tail lights at this point. I like, I like the range. You don't have to worry about them quitting on you on the long rides. In this mode, I think it gets like 27 hours. It's some, just, just a lot of hours. You go a few months before you need to mess with them. The road has a lot of debris. I check the traffic, I move over, I let everybody know. It's just a lot, just a mess. The pace has picked up. I'm getting near the top of zone two. I just go ahead and rock. Oh, there's a guy parked and he left the door open on the highway. Close the door! I told Paul, that would make too much sense. He, he parked on the side of the road and left his door open. So now when a car comes and takes that door off, who do you blame? I just roll through and I'm riding at a pace. Well, I guess I've hit tempo. Um, I don't know what it is. I've always been like that, even in soccer. Once I get going, I don't like to slow down. And at this point, we're just going. And I just roll through and I think uh, John is back in the draft. We've been sitting up there for a while, so I figure I'd come to the front. Now we're riding. I'm at sweet spot. You see my cadence is up. It's early in the ride, but keep it up. I ride all kinds of cadences. You will see that today. Because when I'm following Jerry, I ended up just switching mode and going into what I call the big gear low cadence drills. Not very low, but lower than my norm, especially on the climbs. I use that today. That's how you build your strength, the muscular endurance. You need to be able to do it all. Actually, why it says minus zero over there, this is not a minus zero. This road's going up. It takes it a while sometimes for the GPS to really pick up. It's not a minus one here. Can I stress how much I love those mud gardens? All these guys on this ride had dirty patches on their shorts. And it's not so much the dirt as opposed to the water. I 
go to the pulp and make sure the stretch of root is clean to kind of come through. It's just the water getting on your bum on a cold day. It makes you cold. But who wants wet shorts on a cold day? No. Those mud guards are so light and easy to use. I just, I'm so glad I found them. Unless I get caught in the rain, if I know it's going to rain, it will be on the bike. Or if it might rain, it will be on the bike. They don't affect anything going on with your bike. At this point here, the road's very wet. So I I get a little bit of spray from, I think, from my tourist wheel. Then I'm behind Arturia. Paul's cleaning the camera because we got raindrops on it. And then we hit a patch where there's a lot of water. And then we, I just go ahead and back off of the group a little bit. I think it's somewhere here. We get a lot, yeah, right there. A lot of spray. So I just back off. It's all on my arms. I hate that. <laughs> you can see the little bit of water at the bottom of my tire. So it's wet. It's wetter here, right in this section. You can see the water in my tire. That's a little bit of water there. Well, there's nothing coming up because of the mud garden, so it's easier to follow me. So I just stay back. At this point, I can see our tourists having problems. And then I tell Paul. I checked for cars before I did that. I kind of suspected. So we'll just roll past and get up there, because these guys are moving. Jerry's at the front, so. Notice I'm always looking behind. If I'm gonna be messing with the main lanes, I wanna make sure what's coming or what may be coming. Because once you're gonna use the lane, it's your responsibility to make sure it's clear. So I don't just move out there blindly. Even if somebody were to fall in front of me, my, my correction or change will be to the right, not left. Because you don't know what's back there unless you have time to look behind. But if you do, then you can also, also stop. So I always make my move away from traffic. If I can't stop and something, somebody or there's a crash, I go to the side of the road. Never try to go in the, in the, lane, the main lane unless it's a closed road or you're on a closed course. Just always assume there's a car there. Notice my heart rate dropped about 20 beats yep. while I'm sitting behind these guys. This is where we're slowing down and I see Jerry turn into this service station. I ask him if he's okay. I'm not sure what he's doing at this point. And then Mark says somebody needs to use the restroom. And I realized, oh, it's John. Well, John had mentioned it to me casually. So you hear Paul DeLonga say when we stop, he's that like, might as well use it while we're here, which makes sense. You know, on a cold day, yeah. I drink throughout the week when I'm off the bike, I'm always drinking. So yeah, I can always use the restroom. There's a Turo on the right. I'm on it, use it. So Paul said he's going to use it. I end up taking Neville. the camera from him. Neville. I'm looking for Neville. I said, Neville and Mark will turn around. Okay. Mark will turn around before Neville. Neville turned around after we got across 1488. Said it's too wet. <laughs> Funny thing, I'm laughing because Neville is from, from Britain. And this is their weather. I had told him in the parking lot off camera that uh, this is British Green weather. Drops on. Yeah. So we've used the restroom. The I'm turning on the camera up. here. Please. We're waiting on the rest of the people. I don't get to go out much. You can't do too many hours during the week, so. Weekends? Yeah. Yeah, this is at 10 o'clock at night. Girl. So this morning and last night, I drank a lot of water. <laughs> you know. Good morning. How you doing, sir? Good. How are you doing? Good, good. Where's Ben going to high school at? That way, uh, there's a there's like an overpass. Don't take the overpass. Just exit. The school's on the right. 
Thank you. Okay. He's asking about Magnolia High about School. About a mile or so. It's not far. There's, there's two of them. You know that. Uh, wait a minute. He says there's two, sir. Is there a different one? Yeah, there's, there's, there's one over in 1774 as well. But this is the closest one. It's called Magnolia High School as well? Yeah, West Magnolia High School. So which one are you looking for? There's two of them. West, West Magnolia and Magnolia. That's right here. That's right here. About a mile. Yeah. About a mile. That's it. That's it. That's the one. Just, just take he the said exit. East of one forty nine. So that's the correct one. I did not know there was another high school on the west. Okay. What they're talking about is if you go over the overpass and go straight. Learn something new. That's West Magnolia. <laughs> this main high school here we go by. I've been in all of them. I don't know if the camera will pick up. Paul's daughter uh, did volleyball, and so Paul said he used to go to all these schools. Yeah, all this school. The, I had to be in there. To support. Talking about Paulie Longa, daughter. That's what I'm laughing at. I, I don't know what I said. And then I'm talking about those guys that turn around. Talking about it's too wet. Please. I think the only thing you need are a couple of mud guards or whatever to keep the water off of you because it will keep your, your shoes clean and uh, your bum clean and then your mates that are following you will be clean. And I like that in the UK they uh, require that you get mud guards if you're going to ride with the group in, in the wet. I think it just makes sense. And, you know, and the ones I have they're easy to install. Once you set them up, you know, 10 seconds, and strap, put the strap on as like putting the computer on your bike. So we're, we're riding up the road, these guys are hanging back chat. And this is another thing that you shouldn't do unless you like Paul Ilonga and some of the other riders have been riding a lot. Because Arturo ends up getting dropped when these guys decide to ride up to us. Because when you, when you hang back like this, to close that gap, you have to work harder than we are to get to us. And that's, you hit, you, you're going zone four, and that's hard. This is where we lost Arturo after these guys start to really ride. Then when Jerry goes to the front. Jerry is standing in a large gear and just kind of rolling it right there. I notice he does that often, especially on the front. You end up using a bit more force, but you use your upper body as well to get through the climb. It's something you want to build up. You know, Jerry rides a lot. Jerry rides like 16,000 miles or more a year. So he, he rides lots. He rides more than I do. You know, he definitely loves riding. That's what we, we call Jerry the hard man. He's one of the hard men. And on Sunday, I rode solo because nobody showed up. The Sunday was wetter and colder than this ride you're looking at. So I left early. We were supposed to meet at Cross. I got there at 7.30. Nobody was there on Sunday. So I just took off. I don't wait. I got there on time. Continue riding. I wanted to get back. So I did my loop, and on the way back in 1488, Mark was there, rolled up on him. Mark was out riding alone in the rain and the wet. So Mark is a hard man, and he, he's doing it quietly. I was not aware. I mean, I could tell, you know, he's getting in better condition after the time off the bike. And that's what it takes. You got to ride. So this is where it is start to go to close the gap. I don't know if you can see that these guys are a little dirty. Maybe we'll get another shot. They're getting water on there. Now, John is spinning a lot. He really should shift up here. I don't like to spin excessively unless... Uh, if, I'm, if I feel like I'm moving forward, I'll, I'll spin that gear. But if I feel like I'm spinning and I'm not making progress, then it's time to move a little harder here. Or else you just end up taxing yourself aerobically. So they're closing the gap, and this is where we lost our tour. Not 36, you see up there, 35 kilometers. That's what we're doing. They had to do about 40 to come up to us. That's what I mean. Don't hang back. With the stronger riders, you have to work hard. Stay vigilant and stay with the group. So you, your, your energy output is the same throughout the ride. 
Jerry does this intentionally because Jerry wants to go hard, but Jerry likes the company of other riders. So Jerry will let the group go and ride up to the group. That's his workout. Or he'll tell the group, I'm going for this KOM. You know, whoever wants to go can latch on. And you'll see he'll go for one later in the ride. And I, I go with him and, and what's his name? John bridges up. And the three of us take off. There's a KOM, I think, at the end of that end of Jackson Road. I, that's what I suspected. But, uh, you know, that's the way. This is the, the, the exit to Magnolia High School. See the brown building on the right there? That big, look like a uh, bunker style building. That's the high school. That's what that gentleman was, was asking about. That whole, everything you see there on the right, that's Magnolia High School. Before the overpass, everybody had to go in front of the high school road went by. This overpass takes us over the railroad tracks. So at this point, we're pulling, and I think, I don't know if Paul Longer moves up, I think he does. Maybe not. But I, I end up telling Paul H to uh, the downshift. As we begin this climb, see it says 2%. It gets steeper. See Jerry's dead? Jerry doesn't want to downshift. He wants to tax his legs, so he stands. Now, Paul H was pushing a harder gear than necessary because he was laboring, and I whispered to him, I said, downshift one. And then he did it, and all of a sudden, his pedaling just eased, but his speed did not drop. Somewhere I think I already told him, he already did it. You can see Mark putting his body into the bike there. And Jerry just stands. You see all the spray from Jerry's wheel? You look at the back of his bottom of his jersey, it's already a little dirty. Dirty. And that's the thing, when it's cold and wet, that adds up to where you start getting cold back there. And then some people have those things called ass savers. The little plastic you wedge there. I have I have one, I've used it before. That will help. That will keep that water off of you. It will help the people following you, but it will keep your bum clean. So at, at, at minimum, get that if you're going to be riding in the right. Keep that water from getting on your rear. I like to get more clean. And I'm spoiled now. My shoes and everything, just a little, those specs are on the shoes. You can't afford that. But as far as my kit is clean. So Polish rode this climb well. And he was not laboring, his cadence was up, it was good to see. We're up there. In second position, we have Paul is marked behind him. Paul is starts to slow down too much, and so I move to the left to take this. I'm very, I ride in the rain a lot, so I'm very comfortable with, and I always talk about how not to lean the bike, taking wide lines. I'm not, I don't take any risks, but I'm not afraid of riding in the rain. When you don't ride in the wet, there's a bit of uncomfortableness that comes up, so you gotta get yourself up to speed. You can see I'm already in the corner just going. I'm not doing anything special, I'm just taking the speed that the downhill gave. And I think that riding in the wet really improves your bike handling because you, you learn to respect the road and that transfers to when it's dry to where you don't overcook things. I hate falling so I'll, I'll, I'll much rather slow down a little bit in the fall. That's where I noticed that my pocket, my security pocket was open because the, the cloth that I showed, the string had come out and the wind was flapping it around. So that's what I'm doing back there. So I sat up and pushed it in and zipped it up. So every time Paul does this, this is something we've discussed. What happens is that's the challenge with filming when it's wet. You get water on the thing, you gotta clean it. Every time you touch that, the gimbal doesn't like anything touching the camera because it, it, it's like it's load on the motor of the gimbal and it messes up the calibration. So we, we try to avoid touching the camera once we turn on the gimbal. So what we do yes, is sir. we turn the camera on uh, first, then we turn uh, on the gimbal. That's why when it starts, initially the camera may be looking up at the sky or something like that. We hit the light over here. That's when we realize the Turo is not here. Huh? Uh, was he at the store? Yeah. So when, 
uh, no, no, no. He's when trying. Jerry put the hammer down, down, that's when it threw it back down. He ends he up he's like, a couple, he he's like way, two minutes Mark? behind. Yeah. He's not going to be able to stay with us. We can wait. Let's find out what he's doing. Yeah, so we can wait to find Let's out what he's doing, but road, he's not going to hold his pace. He needs to do a little more He was riding. there, but uh, I saw his light. Uh, I know he's got like a big light on the front. Did anybody see him coming down the hill? He was on the bridge. He was on the bridge. Did he, did he go straight? He was, about, yeah. he was about two minutes behind us. That's significant. Somebody said he's two minutes behind. I was like, that's significant. Uh, we just wanted to find out what he's doing, but we don't see him at all. Somebody rode by, back. Yeah, I saw his light when I looked back. Uh oh, it must have been his light. It was John's I light really that I saw. Bright. So we just go, go ahead and proceed, because he said he knew the area. Uh, Mark had asked him in the parking lot whether he knew the road. He said he knew the road. I think he knew he may not be able to hang with the group. That's kind of what uh, that was about. So we go ahead and proceed north on... 149 and this time we're going straight to where it becomes Jackson Road we're not going to turn right where it continues at 140 John's pulling at the front. Mark's following. Paul is there. I have the camera. I asked Paul for the camera so I could get him on film. that Paul has on his bike, it's made by, I believe, uh, UT, I think it's uh, out of surface, one of the other companies, but well, we've been getting anywhere between four to six hours from these lights lately. So on our long days, what we've been doing was, we've been heading with the group to turn on the real light and just turn it back on when we're riding solo. So with the Hotshot products, we don't have to do that. So this part of the area, the roads are drier, well the shoulders are nice and dry here. A few little spots where you get specks of water. Um, and we end up with some smudges on the camera and on the wall. I mean, it wasn't too bad. I was not aware of it. <laughs> so, the good thing is it didn't obscure the picture too bad. So there's so many positives I love about the Cyberlife product besides their range, visibility. I just like that you can put them on your bike, pick a setting, and the sucker will last for at least two months or more before you need to charge it up. So the battery technology has come a long way based on the setting you use. It's all USB rechargeable. So they're, they're around $35, $40 each, which is a pretty good price point for safety or anything really. But best of all, your safety, very inexpensive, functional product. You can see most people in this, in this group have lights. No reason to not have one. There are all kinds out there. I'm always striving to get better stuff and introduce them to the channel. So Paul H behind me looking good on his bike. Riders that the formula just worked for. Um, 
as I said earlier, he was sitting 3.4 centimeters too high, which is a lot. If I'm three millimeters high from my saddle, I start getting saddle sores, I get pain in my left knee. When you get pains in your knee, it's not always both knees, but the body will favor, like your dominant leg will favor, and it might be okay. And then the other leg is where you'll have the pain. I'm dominant on my right side. So, if my saddle's off by as little as three millimeters higher, I get pain, what we call anterior pain, which is pain in the front of your knee. If my saddle's too low, and I get posterior pain, so it feels like pressure on the back of your knee. You can see that Mark is using a heavier gear. You see Paul is spinning a lighter. You just find a rhythm that works for you. There are no hard, fast rules. What you do have to consider is that when you need to accelerate, try to avoid being in a very high gear because you use so much more force to get the momentum out of that gear and you will not accelerate very quickly in a very long gear. And the gears you use will vary depending on your fitness and the conditions, the terrain, the wind, whatever. John is sitting at the front, he's pulling. Um, Jerry usually stays at the back, he's not really drafting very closely, he never does. He sits in a gear and, and Jerry rides to where, it's as if to say, he's riding, that's what I've observed. Because I used to do that, I used to do the same thing. He rides, as if to say he's riding solo, even when he's with the group. So he'll sit at the back, leave a gap, because he doesn't need the draft and he'll ride to where he's getting a full workout even when he's not at the front. There are a lot of riders that do that. So if when you're in good condition and you're riding with a group that doesn't stress you the whole time, you can do that so you get you increase your effort the whole time. So you're not sitting at the front all the time. So there are a lot of ways to where you can ride with a group that is not super hard for you and still have a great morning by sitting in the wind like Jerry does. So John pulls off the front. We roll through here. Mark takes over and we're heading towards Jackson Road. Heading north. It says, yeah, we're doing north and northwest. Well, I think it's mostly north. We're gonna, it's hard. It's like a cross between westerly and north. That's why you see if you look at the overlay of both the cycles. It's kind of split in the middle. Knowing where we're going, uh, basically, I'm saving my legs, I'm saving my effort because I know we're doing a long ride. And this road is no slap. Right here, it may not register, but it's at least 0 0.8. It's going up, you can see it, where that truck went. You can tell by Mark's body language that he's putting more force in the pedals. It goes up and then it'll level off. If anything, you'll get a slight downhill. I believe that's the intersection over there, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I believe that's what, if you turn right, it's 149. If you go straight, it's Jackson Road. straight here and 
we'll slow down and also let these cars come through. There's a truck over there, it comes through, and then we go. If you turn right, this highway continues that way. This is Jackson Road. A nice climb, we've got new pavement. So Jerry gets a Mark's wheel. I'm in a, a large gear relatively, and I just go ahead and power it. I want to feel my legs work. I ride up to Jerry and Mark. That's a slight grade, that's at 1%. Pulling into the wind. So when you're in a group like this and you see, you know, Jerry is very strong. Mark's been pulling. You see Jerry move up. I'm behind Jerry. You want to now start paying attention when you see the heavy hitters move to the front. That means the riding is about to begin in earnest. It says you gotta get a nose for it. Whenever I'm with a group, I can tell. And you'll you'll develop that too. And that's why when you go to places you gotta keep up with, you know, who the guys are that are driving the pace. I'm reaching for a gel here to get something in my system. I'm not hungry or anything. Those of you who saw the prologue, you know I already took a gel before we left the house. I'm taking a gel for the next hour. At this point, it's a little over an hour into the ride. And so I'm putting something in the tank. This, there was something wrong with my cleats on this day. It bothered me to the point where late in the ride, we had uh, Paul and I stopped. I think after, it was after Jerry had gone home. We stopped and I used my multi-tool. The cleat bolts had come loose because this felt like it was sticky. The left one felt a little off. I'm pulling my shorts down because the silicone does not grab the wool very well. And I don't like my shorts to move up and bunch up. I like them stretched out. So I'm getting them out of the way. Because if they bunch up under you, they can cause uh, discomfort. There's a vulture sitting there cleaning up. And then there he is, flies out of the way. I think there's some little animal that was hit by a car. So don't ignore if your shorts bunching up in the perineum, the soft tissue area. Stretch it out, get it out of the way, because it can cause abrasion. But even if your saddle, and I think I'm going to make a note to make a video about it. Even if your saddle height is right, you can still get saddle sores if your fore aft is off. I'll make a note to make a video about that. I think that's an important, important comment. Especially for those of you who DIY. So how quickly I got the gel out, opened it, got it ingested and continued riding. You need to practice that when you ride solo. It shouldn't be a big deal to reach for food. You'd be amazed that there are a lot of riders that are not comfortable doing that. They go too long without food and you can bomb. journey on this road from 149 until we got here the wind's been pounding us so that's a lot of energy that's being used so you have to pay attention to that you have to make sure you draft well mark pulls off the front i think i told him good pull or something like that so paul is behind me we're rolling through jerry takes over and begins to ride at his pace which is hard for many riders if you look at my heart rate right now, it says 147. As we continue to ride, it's going to go up. Because this road is going to continue. If you look at the road, it's going up. The entire trip today, we're gaining elevation. 
now it says one percent we're just going up anytime you go north you're going up that's why we like to come out here it's one of the main reasons besides the fact that there's not a whole lot of industry out here so it's quiet See my heart rate, it's gone up nine beats since I mentioned it. I'm estimating. It's in the 150s now. If you watch me, I've gotten a little lower because I know there's more to come. We've got two large hills at the end, and I think there's a Strava segment out here. And anywhere there's a Strava segment, Jerry likes to go for it. And on this stretch of the road, I decided that I would just sit on Jerry's wheel, regardless of what he did, and just stay there because I felt fine. And I welcome the, the effort. You look ahead, you can see the road going up and then it goes to the left. Beautiful road, look at this. This is just beautiful. I'm trying to pull the vest out, but I grabbed the jersey and then I end up catching the vest and pulling it down. then it gets there but uh, it reacts a lot quickly especially going down as soon as you turn up the power you can see I'm coasting here camera you see it looked like mud it got on there a while back when I was holding it on the highway there when Mark was pulling I believe oh with the job one of them anyway we got the spec on that I just I was not aware of it and the good thing is it did not obscure too much of the view but this entire time the pace is nice and hard and I've mentioned it before if I'm in zone 2 in the group I mean, the person in front is hard, harder than zone two. And Jerry can do this all day. I mean, he's been sick for like two weeks. He's just getting back in this program, and he's at the front pole. That's what happens. You don't lose it when you do a lot of consistent training. Jerry rides a lot of big miles. He's very fit, so it's like you, it's in the bank. And I mentioned it to him on his ride. We were talking about the fact that he's been sick. I told him, it's in the bank. This is just a beautiful road. Even when we come through here, like I come through here by myself, it's this quiet. Even during the week, if I have the time to come out this far, it's nice on this road. You can hear the wind. So we got the wind, we got the hills, it's hard. And if you're not conditioned, that's why I told the guys at the stop, I said our tour was not going to be able to keep up with us. When I used to compete, I did not do group rides until after riding for at least six weeks by myself. Especially if I've been off. You want to get yourself in some kind of decent condition, and then you find a group and maybe latch on to group B or C. You don't just show up out of shape to a fast group. It's not gonna be a lot of fun. And you shouldn't expect the fast riders that have been training consistently to wait for you. As I've explained on here, I don't do that. Because there are a lot of people that make excuses. We had the same thing this week again. The same people 
those of you who follow these rides can guess who I'm talking about. Oh, it's rainy, I'm not gonna ride. I'm gonna wait till it uh, for drier weather. So the two guys who are saying that, the first one, of course, those of you who know I'm talking about is Bob. And then the second one was Rob, the guy who got dropped on Sunday when I did the double header ride. It's funny how the very people who can't keep up are people who don't ride. That's the pattern. If you're riding consistently, you will be fine. It's right there. Just think about it. Look in your group or who are you, your mates that you ride with. The people who don't ride, they struggle. Especially if they're riding with people who do ride consistently. Right here, this road is going up. You can see it says 1%. It's going to be more than that. And Jerry puts down the power. And about six or seven months ago, this would have been a problem really for me because I wasn't riding at this level when I hooked up with Mo's group. Jerry rides with Mo's group. And he even told me on this ride, he's like, he was asking, are you gonna start racing? You know, because you're like, you're in good shape and this and that, you know, and we all laughed about it. Uh, but it was it was nice to hear that from you. It was a compliment. It just it's encouraging and, uh, and it makes you want to keep doing what you've been doing. He noticed, he noticed it. So we're, we're heading zone four here. We're going hard here. This is almost race space, pretty much race space here. So I realized this was the first climb. It's a, it's a nice long climb, it kind of settles down here. I think in a little while Jerry pulls off. Yeah, right here, Jerry pulls up. I just resist, I just continue the effort. And because the terrain changes, my heart rate will drop accordingly. I let it fall. I don't continue to force because we've got another, a slightly shorter but steeper climb coming at the end of Jackson Road. So I just continue the tempo. My heart rate dropped about this point like six or seven beats, which is primarily because of the terrain and the fact that I did not use a harder gear per se. I continue to ride and Jerry comes back to the front because this is where the, the, the other hill is starting now and I get on his wheel. I don't know, I think this part is a segment or something because he went really hard. He went harder here, you can see. It dips, it turns to the left, and there's the climb. And that bump at the top really gets there in a hurry. It bites the legs. But right about here, we kick up, there it puts down the power. You can tell by my body language. And I start to drive the pedals, and we just pull away. John bridges up to us. It took everything he had to get up there. But we're moving. The power is down. We're going home. You make up a lot of ground on the hills and you also open gaps really well on the hills because that's rocks. That's where you put the rocks into play. There's no uh, free speed like you would have on the flats can't back off, you have to put the power down. We get to the intersection up there, I don't really want to stop at this point. I'm coasting right there, you can see it says zero RPM. I know we're turning right. Jerry does a U-turn to come back for the group. And I go ahead and just turn right and keep riding. It just feels better for me to just keep riding once I go hard like that. I don't want to stop or slow down. So I turn right and I keep riding. And just Jerry coming back to, to get the group together. John turns. Paulie Longa passes John here. I look back and I see them. And I begin to just kind of soft pedal. 
waiting for them to get on my wheel. I don't like to go hard and then just abruptly stop. I've never liked that. So we ride so much that even when I go hard, it takes a lot of work to get my heart rate up. But I don't get out of breath that easily, but I much rather keep riding and kind of get my legs to loosen back up, you know, from the, the effort. Like get, you know, get the lactate out of your legs. And that's why I kept riding. So I'm looking back all the time. I'm, I'm gauging when they're going to get on my wheel. And they get up there and then Paul says, I think we're, we're here or we're all here. Something like that. And then I just resume. You can hear the wind. But that was, that was hard. That was pretty close to full gas. We didn't go that long, but that was hard. That was, that was just full power. That's what I mean. I don't care if, if, even though I didn't have a power meter, I did what was necessary to stay on Jerry's wheel. So the thing is, is that it's nice to have a power meter, but if you have a power meter and you can't produce those watts, you will still get dropped. So you've got to be able to go hard when necessary. And, and what Jerry explained to me what they do with these KOMs is, he'll do a 100 mile ride where he'll, a section he'll go for a KOM and actually set a KOM while doing a big ride. That's, that's pretty taxing. That's just some serious training. So I like how they use the KOM. And you know, so Fabian, he said Fabian took a KOM from him and he's gonna try to get it back. Or Mo might have a, a KOM that they might try to get or whatever. And then with the RD, we found out the RDBC Grand Fondo is on April 7th this year. And so there's a KOM being offered and Mo has already laid down the challenge saying that that's mine, don't even think about it. You know, so they're using it very healthily and to push themselves. I don't really know where all these KOMs are when I load my stuff on Strava and it will tell me, oh, you got a personal best or a PR on this KOM that someone set up the segments. And so, you know, I just I just go hard during my, my longer rides from time to time. So going with Jerry back there was perfect. This is a little over an hour into the ride. We've been riding an hour 40, thereabouts, Paul and I, go to the road from the house. An hour, well, hour 50, I guess. So I just sit at the front and continue pulling. And you will see in a little bit, I will show how easy it is to get dropped in a group. Uh, if you don't pay attention, it can happen because you can get caught at a bad moment. Let's say you just made an effort and you have not recovered from the effort that you went harder than you were accustomed to. And you have never, had not recovered, but then the group didn't slow down. And then you let a gap open and you got to tap back into a hard effort. If you have not prepared your body to do that, that's how you can get drunk. So after I'm done pulling here in, in a few kilometers, I will pull off. And then what ends up happening is John, who went with us on that effort, comes around. Yeah, right here. I pull off and I kind of motion to Paul. He knows to just maybe either take a short pull or just pull off and save his energy because we're doing a long day. So he pulls off. You can see John come through and John lifts the pace because we're going up and into the wind. So I look back and I, I go ahead and get on Paul Itch's wheel. Then I realize Paul Ilonga is not on my wheel. So I look back for him. I back off the power. And then, because Jerry's behind it. I know Jerry can ride up to those guys. I'm not worried about Jerry. So right here now, I turn on the power. I'm in a larger gear. I want to use my strength. And I start to ride. I'm not in a hurry to get there this instant. That's not paramount. What's paramount is I leverage the power and effort that I can hold for longer than I need to because you don't want to get up there gas. This is how you get dropped if you don't have the strength. And so basically I am riding hard here. You can see my heart rate going up and I'm going to ride up to them because we're going up a slight grade into the wind. It may not say probably 0.7 or whatever. Then I said one. I could feel it. 
but I was doing it to where I did not go ex in an explosive manner to drop the person on my wheel. I kept it a little under top power so that it would be steadier. But I still had work to get up there. So you miss you miss a wheel that, that's coming by after your pull, and you're gonna have to work hard to get back up there. I don't mind putting out the effort. I mean, this is where I get my, my work in. And when Paul and I ride, I, I ride at the front when I'm feeling good. And if I need a break, Paul and Longo will come to the front. But for the most part, I don't mind sitting at the front and just kind of working until he comes to take his pull. So right there, when I waited for him, the gap opened quicker than I thought it would because John just pulled through really fast. And so I wanted to make sure that I did not pull too quickly to open a gap behind me. So you have to ride for the people sometimes that you're riding with. Be turning here because I listen to Mark. Mark said we're going to take Mount Mariah Road. This is 1486 that we're on. It's a left turn. I check for traffic. The road's clear. We're turning left after the river track. You will see John Point. This is Mount Mariah Road. And in about maybe three kilometers, we come to a store. But Mark had said he needed a top of his fluids. Because I ended up telling him I didn't need to stop. But he said he needed a top of his fluids. And so once they stop, I go ahead and just use the restroom because my bottles are still full. So Paul H. rolls through. That's John over there. And so the six of us, uh, Paul Ilonga, Jerry, and I decided to just start. We start to chat because the store's right up this road. The power's off, and we're heading to the break. I think this is what Mark is telling me. He's going to top off his uh, bottles, you know. back here chatting. I'm not sure what we're talking about, but whatever it is, we're having a blast. And this is the area I got the thumbnail from because we're having so much fun that I'm laughing ear to ear. And it's really good for the spirit. You get out on a Saturday morning and you're just having a blast with your mates. Not sure what we're talking about, but we're laughing. Paul's laughing too, but the camera doesn't grab him. I don't remember what we're talking about, but we're always laughing. And this, this, these are our rides, guys. We, we guys, we guys and girls, we have a, a lot of fun. Even when it's just Paul and I, we're always finding stuff to laugh about. We, we even mess with the animals, and like the squirrels never cross the road completely. They'll, they'll get on the road and then stop a little bit, then get to the yellow line, stop. They, they always like, they, they trust nothing. So they're always looking around while they're crossing. And I, we always comment about stuff that we notice that the animals do. We, we moved over for these cars to go by. This is a good rear shot by Paul Long Day. Good camera work, my brother. That looks good there. I don't get to see myself from this vantage point. The wind's blowing, so it's like, it, it felt cooler than the forecast. Now what I've done on my phone is I've added the area called Conroe and I've added Magnolia to my weather app because the temperatures are always a few degrees off and then depending on the wind direction you have to dress for that too. So I was dressed perfectly for the day. I'm glad I went outside. 
So I look for traffic, nothing's there. We chat and we take take over the whole lane so we can just chat. And so when you're riding like this, it is your responsibility to keep your eye out back. Check there so you're not impeding the other road users. It's nice to do this. This road is quiet and we're chatting, but don't hold up other road users. The woodlands uh, have their roads closed because of there's a marathon going on the woodlands uh, during this ride Saturday. And so it was cool to be riding on the roads and have cones and they let us through because we're on bikes. And so we don't bother the runners, but it was nice. But even on the way back, we were riding because of the cones making the lanes narrower than normal. We used the, the little shoulder in the woodlands to allow the car traffic to get by. You see, we lined up again because that car is coming. When you're doing that, I think this guy ends up staying behind us because we're almost at the intersection. But when you do that, they don't mind. But if you're just on the road because, oh, you have the right to be there and you're just blocking the road, you know, it's just kind of rude. I think it's just not cool. So anyway, I hope you all got a chance to get out there and get some K's in. But this is what we did on Saturday. We go across Highway 105 here. There is a store, Mark and them are already there, but we use that opportunity to kind of spin down. Always try to spin down after your hard efforts. It's good to get the lactate out of your legs. Now we stopped at this store. This is the store that used to sell ice, but nobody was buying, so they, they changed their mind and removed the sign. <laughs> get those K's in and keep those doctors fired.